Hello, and welcome to the News Paste Podcast. You can find us, of course, on most podcast platforms, and uh, you can find us on newspaste.com. And my name is Johnny Vedmore, and I'm here with a really, really interesting guy who I'm looking forward to talking with, because finally, for the first time, we're going to talk out loud about some of the stuff we've been working on for a while. Um, I'll introduce you very soon, but I started working with this gentleman. I mean, you get a lot of tips from people, and sometimes you, you, you know, when you're investigating, they've read your work and they say, Oh, have you seen over here? Or have you seen over here? And it was just like a synchronicity thing where the tips just happened to be where I was focused and it caught my attention. And then we started having a nice long conversation uh, about stuff. And then slowly we started working together and we started researching together. And he's a very uh, clever young researcher. I hope he doesn't mind me saying the words, the word young in there. I don't mean it in any way apart from, you know, I, I mean, if I was doing what he was, he's doing now when I was his age, I would have been a lot more further along than I am now later on especially uh seeing as this guy is pretty he's pretty savvy so Khan Disley is a computer science student from Turkey studies in Paris you can find him on Twitter um at Khan underscore underscore Disley and uh you can find his sub stack at Khan Disley one word dot substack dot com. I should probably tell you how to spell Khan Disley because I love it. It's like screaming Khan into the sky, <laughs> just as you would expect if you're a fan of Star Wars, uh, Star Trek. Sorry, Khan. So it's K A A N. Wonderful. And Disley is D I S L I. Khan Disley, welcome to the Newspace Podcast. Thanks for coming on. How are you? Great to be here. I'm well. How about you? Ah, uh, life is hard all of the time. You know what it's like. You're trudging through these facts, and none of them make life any easier. Um, but I'm really happy that we're finally having a conversation uh, out loud. Something that's going to be recorded down and for people to listen to. Because first of all, I got to say thank you. I noted you down when I uh, wrote the German Marshall Fund article on unlimited hangout which was really the fourth of the klaus schwab pieces um i noted down at the end that you had helped with a load of research and originally we were meant to be doing that was the idea oh we do this german marshall fund piece but then you went away and it basically a, a piece that was already like seven to ten thousand plus words i think it might have even gone up to twelve thousand by the end the german marshall fund piece was going to be a crazy amount because you found a whole different thing out there that was all connected um and you found a load of interconnected stuff. And so you started working on that. And I used some of the research uh, for the German Marshall Fund piece. So I noted you down the end there. But I was desperate to get on to this next bit. And it's probably been about eight, nine months, would you say? I believe that? So. Yeah. yeah. So how uh, tell people a little bit about yourself i mean i've explained a bit and of course there's not going to be many people you're a very fresh face you're a, mm -hmm. a, a new persona on the scene so tell uh, people a little bit about, about yourself who is khan disley well i'm mostly a computer science student that is also interested in politics so i like to investigate stuff i've been into politics for the past six seven years probably so I do have a bit of a accumulation of knowledge. So at this point, I decided maybe I'm, I should write down or I should publish some of the stuff I've read, some of the stuff I've collected. I've seen your works. And that's what really got me into the uh, invest, investigation parts, because that's what's interesting to me. Uh, the knowledge that people don't see usually published uh, in the mainstream news, you can find yourself and the interesting part is this knowledge anyone can access you can find these documents they're publicly available in the re in the resources section you can of course click on these documents and see the veracity for yourself but the problem is that they're not easily accessible you will not see these on the internet if you're browsing by yourself so you'd have to really know where you're looking to find this information so that's the part that interested me 
some open source work. So, and I contacted you. And after we worked on a few pieces, and finally you've made a really, uh, I think it's a very good piece. You yeah, made it's, a very resourceful piece. It, it's a comprehensive. I don't know if it'll change by, because uh, we'd, we'd, we, even though we're recording this a day before it goes up, uh, or a couple of, a few days before it goes up, this goes out the day before it goes up. But it probably will be called the non-governmental octopus, because really that that explains what we're looking at, doesn't it? We 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 started mm -hmm. researching something. So for the let's go go back a slight bit and give people a little bit of understanding of which part of the political landscape we're in. Um, when I was researching um originally german marshall fund it was a, a few different branches we went off there's the original german marshall fund article and the german marshall fund for people who don't know what they are the general it's, i think it's called the german marshall fund of the united states of america officially um or the united states and the german marshall fund was set up by um a group from german money uh and uh, emanating out of harvard it was uh, Willy Brandt was the chancellor of um, uh, Germany at the time. And he had a very interesting history, lots of different links. Um, and eventually they set up this operation. And it was basically the first day was a load of CFR members opening it. Everyone from David Rockefeller to John J. McCloy are hanging around uh, the New World Order. They look like gangsters up on the, the, the steps when they actually open it up. And they got something like, I think it was 150 million uh, uh, Deutschmarks or 200 million Deutschmarks at the time, a load of money to uh, run these, this project. And what it was, was kind of murky. It was about, oh, Germany is helping fund uh, this CFR um, Harvard, uh, CFR lined Harvard operation, which was to promote democracy around the place on behalf of Germany. Well, of course, Germany has got the Soviets just on their doorstep and every single action they've got to take has got to be for a proxy or conduit. And so German Marshall Fund was going to basically be a proxy, made to be a proxy or conduit, um, not only for researching the, um, the, the situation uh, in the failing Soviet Union, um, but also to introduce leadership programs. Now, I don't know if what comes first in, in that regard, whether it was set up for that reason, but of course, Abby Collins, who was um, put in uh, charge at the German Marshall Fund in running such uh, training courses, etc., um, for years afterwards, had originally run Henry Kissinger's international seminar at Harvard, also that had been shut down five years before after it got revealed of CIA funding. So, obviously, the German Marshall Fund is this really interesting operation, which seems like basically a CFR, CIA operation focused on Eastern Europe um, and is the next stage. Once they worked out that mutual, uh, mutually assured destruction was going to keep people from having big all out fights, no one's going to use the big weapons. Instead, they were going to use perpetual warfare and the like and and as uh, coups and subversive tactics the cold war was in full swing uh the tactics changed and the focus changed and of course what we're doing here is um what we did there was i i had a, i was i i really reported on sort of that section and you took me off to two different branches one of them we'll talk about in the future but still i'd like to probably brush on today is the father of the head of the German Marshall Fund. And then the second part is where, you, and this is, I really mean, I really mean your, your, your name comes first on this article that we're releasing the non-governmental octopus for a very good reason. You led us into this direction completely. I was completely unaware of a lot about this. I'm reporting on the founding of the German Marshall Fund, but to find out that some of the, the things that they wrote and some of the things they were focused on were really fantastic. So can you tell me a little bit about about I don't know if how to start that really. Um, how you ended up looking at uh, Guido Goldman's father 
um, and also this non-governmental octopus? Sure. Well, as you said, we were working on the German Marshall Fund piece, which Guido Goldman is a critical part of. And when you're researching into someone, you you would also want to know if their parents are in influential places, because that that might affect how you've been brought up and how how you'll see things in the future. So, his father Nahum Goldman is a very interesting character as well, and he he was one of the he he's really friends with uh, David Ben Gurion and all the people that founded uh, Israel in 1947, and he is one of the critical people that were involved in getting the getting Israel basically started off as a country having a partition plan between Palestine and Israel and he personally went to America to negotiate with people so that they would have a basically a somewhat of a two-state solution for Palestine because that was not really on the table before and so a few people went to America to negotiate and to basically lobby the American government so they would Create a, a Jewish state in what, what Palestine. Time, what, what time period are we talking here? So what this would be in 1945, 1946 until 1947. So, uh, this is time. I just would. Uh, uh, I, I mean, you're probably going to mention this, but uh, of course, he was friends with Eleanor Roosevelt as well. Um, and Eleanor Roosevelt was pretty uh, on the ground floor, the creation of the UN, you could say, mm -hmm. and had a, a, a role very early on. And they actually got an office, Nahum Goldman, prior to, to Israel being created, got his own office in the United Nations building very early on in 1945. Yeah, he, he was a very influential man. And he... He spoke to David Niles, uh, who who was uh, who was very connected with the people that ran the White House, and he, he was a per he was able to get a David Niles reportedly he was crying when he heard that we could have a Jewish state in Israel, and he was he had tears of joy, and now Golden personally spoke to these people. So there would be a Jewish state in Palestine. And at the moment, people didn't real, realize how important Goldman was because the solution was not implemented immediately. It was sent off to the British and the British kind of looked at it and it wasn't exactly clear if it was a success or not. But in 1947, when it was actually formed and the UN also recognized that Pete and the people in Israel, they realized how important now Goldman was. And Goldman was also involved in the uh German the German government uh, Conrad Adenauer he paid the he paid Israel and the Jewish diaspora for the crimes of Germany during World War II. So he was very involved in that payment process as well. Those were yeah, want... two of his success stories. I keep keep that thought in mind where you're you're on the track. I just want to save to people um, a sentence, a, a, a quotation from uh, that that is in the German Marshall Fund piece to understand Nahum Goldman a bit better, and it comes from a book called The Seventh Million: uh, The Israelis in the Holocaust uh, by Tom Segev. And it's one of the most amazing lines to describe Nahum Goldman. I love it. It's beautiful. It's um, when the Israeli and Jewish representatives walked out of formal negotiations, Nahum Goldman's great hours as a lobbyist and manipulator began. Goldman organized and coordinated a worldwide network of activities aimed at persuading the Germans that it was in their best interest to reach an agreement. As part of this effort, he monitored and even took part in ceaseless haggling in Bonn. He went to see cabinet ministers, senior officials and members of parliament, making his way through the corridors of power and into the inner chambers. He saw everything and heard everything. He plotted intrigues. He shared secrets with supporters, thwarted opponents, collected promises, made threats, a man of a thousand faces. I love yeah. that. I mean, I've I've read that out before on this podcast when I was talking um, uh, to Corey Hughes uh, about Nahum Goldman and the creation of Israel. And I think it's just like so important to understand how much of a influential figure Nahum Goldman was. I mean, continue where you were going. I'm sorry I interrupted you. I'm no, 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 it's okay. Well known uh, for I, doing that. <laughs> no, that's no, fine. Well, he was also very high up in the Jewish agency. This was like an organization, international organization. 
for Jews and uh, Haganah and Irgun. These were terrorist organizations in the Middle East. They were also under the control of this agency. It's not entirely clear how now Golden was involved in these terrorist operations in the Middle East, but he was a very high up member in this organization that also covered the uh, terrorist organizations in the Middle East that led to the creation of Israel. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, then all hell broke loose. <laughs> I mean, the the the. the creation of israel and the people who were behind it were nearly all um Z- prominent zionist leaders and of course sure. you need probably it can be uh said that you need the most uh extreme ideologues of an era to do such a thing as to form a state out of someone else's state during a time which is supposed to be of epic peace after horrific war i mean it's just the timing as well the timing is just terrible it's just terrible um so nahum goldman was a really important person i think that it's really important to put in perspective because it makes guido goldman even more interesting guido goldman separates himself from his father but still also kind of like tries to be close to his father as well in many ways it's a very mixed image and i think he tries to distance himself for very specific reasons because they don't want any connection with israel uh, to come back to the reason why actions are being taken by later on Guido Goldman and the German Marshall Fund, because of course uh, it's really important times in, especially in Harvard, uh, the German Marshall Fund. It what it's, it, it starts off in the early seventies, but had really come from uh, um, an operation that had been closed down in Harvard in nineteen sixty seven and been rumbled, um, and that was a really important year. That whole nineteen sixty six, sixty seven, sixty eight, sixty nine in American and um, global uh, political history is just the moment where a lot of things shifted and power was exerted and control was um implemented in a way that was possibly never going to be reversed in our lifetime anyway um so that's what brings us to this and that's why i say that that's what brings us to this uh so tell people your own journey i love this as an investigator tell people your own journey to leading us down this road where we've written this article, The Non-Governmental Octopus? Well, with the German Marshall Fund piece, uh, I found a document called Reclaiming Democracy that talked about how organizations like the German Marshall Fund, not just the German Marshall Fund, would organize NGOs in different countries in mostly Eastern Europe and in the Balkans. And these organizations would form together to create a pro-EU, pro-NATO, pro-American alliance and to form protests in order to protest the government that was not very American friendly or was not EU friendly. And they would topple these governments at times. In Georgia, they would do this. In Ukraine, we're going to talk about that in a second. They would do this in, in Serbia, they did this in Yugoslavia. And even in Macedonia, they had protests they organized. And these organizations were primarily done through NGOs that were funded by the State Department, by USAID. Uh, Basically, just American-funded NGOs would create not real protests, because you could say there are real protests, but these would be propped up by the American government artificially to create pro-democracy, meaning pro-American protests. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's pro-democracy. Now, for the people, I just let me just uh, shove that in a little bit. In uh, for the people who do have uh, um, have signed up to the Patreon for News Paste and for me and as my supporters, they'll be able to see the video version. And maybe this will come out in uh, a clip because this is a really important document, isn't it, Khan? It's one of them. It's one of the most that we, important that we've seen. And you can find it on the archives. This is what he was referring to. Reclaiming democracy, civil society, and electoral change in Central and Eastern Europe. What I mean, this is... These sort of documents just change world your worldview don't they <laughs> do that have that that feeling with you because that's how it did with me anyway i don't want to put words in your mouth there but how did you well, feel about it i've seen uh i've known about the concept of color revolutions before but i, I had not seen before a document that documents 
every single case in the past at least like 20 30 years uh this th thoroughly so that that was an interesting document for me and and it was published by the german marshall fund that's what made it really interesting and it was it was in a sense the operation was bragged about it wasn't like a this was a nefarious operation yeah yeah that's what the the whole uh, i mean if for anybody this this document a link to this document uh which if uh, for those who can uh see the front cover there i'm trying to i'm trying to alter my screen share to be uh, correct uh is uh, was oh, let's see if i get okay are you hey hey car disley how do you pronounce those two names <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> the, the, the George, George Forbrig, yeah. Joerg Forbridge, and Pavel Dem Demis. I don't know what the accent over the S means. Uh, but there were more than just those two who were involved in this. That, that's kind of the guys who produced it. But as as you see on the document, like Han said, uh, the German Marshall Fund was one of the um, organizations to produce this document alongside the um, Erst Foundation, which I'm also very interested to, to look into. Reclaiming democracy and the idea of reclaiming democracy has a lot of hubris attached to it as well. Um, so, so uh, w you 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 got in touch with me about this document very quick because this is obviously massively important, and I really wanted to put this in the German Marshall Fund, um, but uh, like peace, but it just kind of like barreled barrel rolled as we say it just kept go going it just is so much in there and it led to so many collections and basically what you were saying before is very much true is i've never seen a document where the people who are nefarious in society are um admitting what they do yeah true this was uh very, this was very well documented all the a lot of information here that was not, I don't know if it's public information, but uh, you can read about all these coups or all these color revolutions on Wikipedia or other places. But some of the detailed information we're going to get into, like 30,000 NGOs in Ukraine, those numbers are not very easily accessible unless you have a document like this. Basically, it was 50 to 150 NGOs that, that originally could, could cause that much change right at the start, right in the early days. Later on, you're talking 2004, they're saying 30,000. They've built it up, 30,000. How did they end up with 30,000 NGO plus NGOs in Ukraine in 2004? Well, National Endowment for Democracy, they've admitted that they've been, and same as Victoria Newland, they've admitted that since even before the breakup of the Soviet Union, they've been funding NGOs and they've been promoting democracy in Ukraine since 1989, even before the breakup of the Soviet Union. So the groundwork was laid much before, decades before. And so these NGOs, I don't want anyone to think these are like massive NGOs, like a National Endowment for Democracy, which we'll talk about, is a very big NGO. Same with the Open Society Foundation. These are very big primary NGOs. But in Ukraine, there's 30,000, you would say, smaller NGOs that even though individually they probably will not be able to cause anything, when, when you have thousands of these NGOs, it seems like an organic organization, but they're all, they've all been funded. And if you go on, a, for example, when you see on social media this protest or this propaganda that some NGO has pushed, you think it's an organic, but... It's just been microfinanced throughout. It's been split across many NGOs so that you would think that it's a natural person. As your neighbor would be also promoting this or your neighbor would think, yeah, mm -hmm. I want to be a pro-American, pro-NATO country, but it's all artificial. That's the extraordinary thing, that artificial nature of it was so successful by 2004 that it was like one in five Ukrainians were politically active during that 
uh, uh, Pora and the Orange Revolution. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a, a significant amount. And I mean, out on the streets, active, mobilized, active, because uh, NGOs, what people don't necessarily realize, you can have like an office with five people working in there who are really skilled at organizing hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands of people. So yep. you have a tool that's that confident and that good, that skilled, and you put it in the right place, doing the right function. You're not just got five people in an office anymore. You've got a hundred thousand people on the ground, motivating another hundred thousand, motivating another hundred thousand, so on and so forth. So the the idea that the, you know that oh each of these NGOs are really small, that will probably be the most likely like comeback you'd often find. And if I may they, add also to the point you said, uh, the, all, most of these NGOs also use as a cover a lot of humanitarian work. You've sent this to this organization. We've sent this to poor uh, C- Syrian kids. We've sent we've. Uh, send these guys to the hospital, we've treated them. So there's a lot of humanitarian cover-up to prevent people from saying, well, how could this organization be a pro-NATO, pro-American propaganda piece if they've helped so many people, if they're a humanitarian organization? So that's, I think, I've seen that that's a common cover that they use. Yeah, logical fallacies are the <laughs> the place they run to. It, 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 does, it does tend to be that virtue is one of the most easiest um, tools to use to manipulate people's idea of what's actually going on. I mean, we saw this during the White Helmets as well. Um, uh, and, and in this, we saw it uh, probably best. What, what helmets were they wearing? Were they green, green. helmets? Yes. And, then, uh, and, then, and then eventually they were the green helmets shooting down from the buildings. But we'll talk about that eventually. And that's the way it works, isn't it? Oh, look at the heroes. Oh, the heroes are shooting me. Why, why is that happening? And then you have to worry about who your heroes and who your villains are. And um, I, I, this is a really interesting, there's so much to go into. And this is one of the things about this article is trying to work out which parts to cover because there's so much to cover, uh, especially about uh, this document itself that was written in 2007, the Reclaiming Democracy document. And um, the, the contents, they have like basically the, the different... Um, uh, they run down the different events that they look at in the document. So the OK98, a campaign of Slovak NGOs for free and fair elections. I mean, uh, that's a euphemism, I'm sure. Glass 99, civil society preparing for uh, the ground for post Tudman Croatia. Islas 2000, an exit in democracy, um, exit to democracy in Serbia. And this Enough. was particularly violent, I would say, because it's also yeah. called the bulldozer revolution, and they because they came with bulldozers, and so wow. Slobodan um, Milosevic he, he had to he had to step down from power because there were all poor protesters mm-hmm. which were trained by the CIA to basically kick him out. Yeah, yeah, that uh, that sort of seems like a reoccurring theme in nearly everything that I'm looking into. This. CIA seem to be hanging around all around here, and uh, but that seems to be what it is for me. I think the CFI and uh, and uh, in X policy creates groups such as um, German Marshall Fund and other things like. Um, eventually, like you could say, uh, you can say that uh, USAID is definitely uh, used as a CIA cutout. Uh, that NED is definitely used as a CIA cutout. Uh, all of these organizations are definitely heavily linked um, to the people who have been enacting coups in various ways. Now, these are the color coups, of course, the color revolutions. And then after the the, the one in Serbia that you said was violent, uh, what this document also covers um, enough exclamation mark um, Kam- Kamara and the Rose Revolution in Georgia. So that I think was 2003. Uh, 2004 something around that time um and then uh it's time pora and the orange revolution in ukraine which of course is most relevant and ends up being really uh, the focus of our attention but as you hear we, we they study just about like 1998 to 2004 it's just six years 
six years six years uh is not a long time for politics it seems in slovakia in croatia in serbia in georgia and in ukraine where these revolutions that have of course got lots of money from these ngos these cia linked ngos these cfr linked ngos ngo linked ngos however you want to call them it's just a matter of how many levels of conduits you want to go through before you find the masters um if i may add if you look at the symbols that they use as well you see a lot of similarity the outboard uh bulldozer revolution symbol of a clenched fist is exactly the same as the georgian revolution the kamara and they use the same exact fist i don't know if you have an image of that uh, and, but... No, I'll, I'll, I'll go and have a little look at it. No, give me, give me a second. Now, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to stop sharing while I do that. And but tell us a little bit more. What, what, I, what more do you know about? Because I didn't really research the Serbian revolution because I was too busy. <laughs> all around i was looking i used like a lot i looked at the slovak uh campaign a lot uh i looked a bit about georgia and then ukraine but i i, I mean try it, it if you try and cover everything you just have a piece which is too long in yeah, the they place. did lots of battles so 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 I, I mean we all know times were hard in serbia during this period <laughs> and it'd been really bad times before um wh what was this revolution like can you describe it to us well I, I, my work was particularly on the ukraine one but there was a lot of similarity with the serbian one uh i, I may add that also the georgian revolution was similar to S serbia in another way as well because the german uh, the georgian protesters were brought to serbia to be trained by the outpour activists so they could go back to georgia and do their protests in georgia to uh, bring the Saakashvili into power. Mm -hmm. So right. th th there's also connections, like direct connections between the protesters in Serbia and the protesters in, for example, uh, Georgia. The focus we put on was on the Ukrainian, um, the Orange Revolution. But of course, this buildup of NGOs is really important to that. And this is the point I'm trying to make. The NGOs... Uh, started off being 50 to 150, but every time a new revolution or uh, um, uh, one of these color revolutions was enacted and was successful, those were lifted up, taken out, and those NGOs and the people in them were popped into other countries, weren't they? They were, they were uh, moved about so that they kept then the pressure and the organization and the skill base just moved on to put pressure on the next bunch of uh, places that needed coups. And if you keep enacting that, I think that's how we get to 2004 and the Ukraine having 30,000 NGOs is NGOs becoming successful as we go along one by one. Um, yeah. So take us through. 2004 can you can well in 2004 they it's called the orange revolution and what they did was basically the same as what they did in 2014 my work was basically focused on 2014 but in ukraine they uh, in 2004 and 5 they also did the same thing they had a pro mostly pro russia a president and they they had it toppled by a uh, vast it's just a massive NGO program that would topple the pro-Russian government and install a pro-NATO government. And this was also conducted by a man named Ole Rybak, who was also in a campaign called Chesno, which was a network of NGO organizations that was able to create organized protests to create a pro-EU government. And th this guy is particularly important because he was the right-hand man of the sitting president so uh it was a textbook style color revolution the same thing they did in the other countries so th that started off like i mean the velvet revolution was really the the first and then you had multiple revolutions then over so that the, well the velvet revolution was, was like 1989 um and then it at least started in 1989 
and then it's just barrel rolled on and by 2004 they have it's become an industry so uh, it, it, you it's what happens after the successful uh, overthrow of these russian aligned uh, political rulers in ukraine in 2004 then well uh, the goal is to basically have also economically have close relations with EU countries and not with Russia because Russia is part of the Eurasian Economic Alliance and they don't want these countries to have close economic relations with Russia because that would make Russia more powerful powerful, and they would make these countries more dependent on Russia. So either way, that's a problem. They would want a EU economic deal so that they have much more resource control over these countries. Uh, and also militarily, they want these countries to part, be a part of NATO. Even though in 2004, they did not really say that out loud. A few years later, in 2008, Georgia and Ukraine both were in a NATO summit. NATO admitted that we like the aspirations of Ukraine and Georgia, and we would want them closely with us in as a NATO member. And this was what provoked the invasion of Georgia by Russia in South Ossetia, Abkhazia. And basically what they want to do is expand their military capabilities in Central Asia and Eastern Europe. And they're, if you would, if you look at a map, they have surrounded Russia with pro-NATO or just NATO members. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is a suff a slow suffocation of the bear or a an attempted slow suffocation? I, 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 I mean, I, I know what I think. What do you think happens once you can't push any further? In what sense? Um, once you've got so close that you're on Russian ground. Because what we're seeing now, I mean, if we skip ahead, before we, we, we'll we go back and we, we've got to really talk about, uh, there's a lot to talk about, about uh, Newland, uh, Ned stuff, Soros and the Open Society stuff, and also uh, the Maidan and what happened and all of that. But um, if we float forward really quickly and we get to where we are now, that method to strangle Russia has reached its end game, surely, hasn't it? We're right on the borderlands of Russia. Surely it would only be Belarus that could be more sinister and serious than than Ukraine. Like the take of, and I, I doubt that would happen. I um, are we at the end game? And does that always lead to war? Because that's what I think. Uh, well, yeah, we were pretty close if you're not at endgame because the only country that would be comparable to Ukraine, as you said, would be Belarus or Georgia. And with Georgia, you've seen in 2008 there was a short war and it was not as bloody as the Ukraine war that's going on right now because the promises were not as serious as it is in Ukraine. But if Georgia was also... If there was a promise to accept Georgia seriously into NATO as well, same thing might happen there. And in Ukraine, in 2022, when Zelensky, he talked about the Budapest Memorandum and he talked about nuclearization again, that's what provoked the war. And that was a small step in a series of steps that provoked us into this war because NATO would not stop funding Ukraine, NATO would not stop having military alliances with the Ukraine, and NATO also would not stop putting missiles in Poland, in Romania, near Russia to provoke Russia to, because that, that puts Moscow in danger. We've seen very recently, if people have been following that, how important Ukraine is because from Bakhmut to rostov on don to Moscow, Wagner was able to move very rapidly in six or seven hours to basically the border of Moscow. So uh, that explains to people, if if Ukraine were to become a NATO member, that explains why the, Ukraine can't become a NATO member, because NATO would quickly be able to, from the ground, access Moscow very fast. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yes, of course they would. Of course they would. I mean, let's, I, I, I mean, let's talk about that a little bit further and let's uh, bring other people 
it, a little bit in on that because strategically the positions of all of these countries are extremely notable and obvious i mean it's always hard to remember the map but for me i spent a lot of my time looking at the globe and russia is such a large country i mean such a vast look at amazingly large country such a fantastically vast country and if you want the points where it is connected to the west then that's georgia ukraine and belarus those are the free countries and of course um that black sea access is massively important as well strategically so georgia uh, is west of the black sea ukraine has black sea to the south um and as we we can see there rostov uh is where you on don is uh where you've got access to the black sea in russia so there's obviously the strategic positions of these countries are massively important and georgia would yeah i i think i would have sparked something much bigger of course um but all of this is just them getting right close to the edge and how close can they go is that the game they're playing khan how close can we go to the Russian bear before it, it slashes our face off? It, well, that seems to be the case, but I don't think they expected Russia would be provoked so much to the point of invading Ukraine. Even though many experts have warned that we're provoking Russia too much, we should not be funding Ukraine, we should not be giving weapons to Ukraine. Even before the Ukraine war that's going on right now, Trump did give lethal weapons to Ukraine. Uh, so this was warned a lot of people warned about the situation that it might exactly go go about the same way that it is going about right now so with georgia we've seen very recently this is also an example of you could say it's not a color revolution but i believe it was a few months ago that there was a law that was going to be passed it's like fora in the united states a foreign a agents act that would it would mean that the NGOs are foreignly funded would be recorded as agents in Georgia. And there were massive protests, so they had to back down. So this was a very recent event. And that's an example of, uh, even though it wasn't a color revolution, but they were able to surpass, they, they, they were able to tell the parliament to stop passing this law because there were so many protests. What what's the difference between like some form of Soviet era committee, um, uh, like cultural or, or or economical like committee? I don't know how you'd describe it. Whatever they had back then, um, and uh, and uh, NGOs and and these guys, if they if they're hidden and their true power and nature is hidden, surely that's both as corrupt as each other. Um, w w do you feel that some of the NGOs, like the creation of NGOs, come from the fact that they had looked to how Soviet structure worked and based NGOs upon something that either uh, was able to infiltrate Soviet structure or um, uh, to mimic Soviet structures? That, that, that's an interesting topic, but I don't think it exactly comes from the, the way Soviets did it. I think the United States probably did it much before because even though it was there, there were not NGOs, organizations like NGOs have existed at all times, like lobbying organizations. We talked about the Jewish agency before. Uh, these organizations are international. They get funded. They do humanitarian work. This type of stuff has existed before, but been massively the amount has increased massively basically in the 1980s after after reagan and we might talk about that later but with national endowment for democracy that's when it really started with national security directive 77 and that created a public uh, diplomacy uh objective that would try to do what they we'll talk about this now yeah 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 talk well, about well they this try now. to do the psychological operations in foreign countries so they can affect them and make them pro democracy this project was called project democracy and this was part of that which was to affect foreign countries tell them yes america is very nice america is very good democracy is very good be with us and 
National Endowment for Democracy in 1983. That's when it got started. And Reagan was also a part of it. And this was a way to spread democracy or have American interests in foreign countries without the involvement of the CIA. The CIA would be in the background and these NGOs would do CIA's work instead. And that's what the founder of the Endowment for Democracy, he said that this stuff, you've been doing it covertly with the CIA before. We can no longer do it in the 60s. We used to do it. We can no longer do it. We have to do it through the endowment so that there's a second layer that is harder to see, basically. That's amazing stuff and an amazing period in history. Um, 1983, 1984, that, around that time is just a really interesting period because it's just after all of these successful CIA projects or, or just after all these supposedly successful CIA projects have been enacted, stuff like the October Surprise in Iran-Contra, uh, and we're just before they all got exposed and it all fell apart. So it's like people were really starting to think, oh, now we can create the whole infrastructure and keep... War. But these guys are going to keep marching forward, aren't they? National Endowment for Democracy, the German Marshall Fund, uh, George Soros is... Uh, uh, shtick because it's more than just um open society isn't it who are the let, let's get on to this thing because you of course we're in the point where you're talking about how the national endowment for democracy got started and obviously i mean to many that sounds a little conspiratorial you know they created it to be another layer but this is what they say themselves often in their documentation or in their speeches they often like to brag about what they do because you need to if you're going to get a future job. So who else is involved in this NGO? Like who are the NGOs, the NGDOs, which are um, non-governmental development organizations and the other organizations um, uh, that that are really active in these regions doing this sort of jiggery pokery? Well, I would say the way we look at the National Endowment for Democracy, that's one of the primary ones. The Open Society Foundation by George Soros, those are basically twin organizations almost. The Freedom House, people might have heard of it, that's also part of it, even though in the piece we don't really focus on that. But to me, it seems like the State Department and USA, the United States Agency for International Development, they are the primary ones funding these smaller, the main NGOs, and down for democracy and Soros and they trickle down to these smaller NGOs in these foreign countries. So I would say at the top, these are the primary ones, but it's, it all comes from the State Department. What do you think George Soros is then as an entity? Do you really think he's private or is this how um, uh, different assets, intelligence assets have obviously a different level of wealth? And that's that's what we're seeing. What, what do you think we see with George Soros? Well, George Soros is an interesting man, and he's definitely very connected with the intelligence department and the state department. He he's famously has said that my interest and the that of the state department are one of the same, one and the same. So he believes that the United States Department is basically an extension of his, or he is an extension of the state department. That's not entirely clear, but he has a lot of say in international politics, and he does meet up with these people in higher ups in Ukraine and. It is said that before even Ukraine had any sort of infrastructure, when it was separated from the Soviet Union, Soros was the one that was most connected with people in the higher ups and with the finance minister, and they would get together and plan the future of Ukraine. So Soros, not just in Ukraine, of course, but many other countries as well, but Ukraine is the primary example we've seen, but he, he is the one that provides funds to these NGOs. And he basically in Macedonia as well. And he does what the state, he's a mouthpiece for the, he does what State Department wants. He, that's what his goal is. You're quite right, quite right. Um, that's what it seems like it. And and that makes then the question of these billionaire philanthropists dash. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I, I I look at Jeffrey Epstein and I see a fixer for intelligence agencies, um, specific certain specific intelligence agencies in particular, um, and he's operating in certain different things. And his peccadillos, his abuse, his rape, and all of that um, makes him 
uh, something that people focus on, but they don't realize that really there's a lot of billionaire um, fixes around doing this sort of thing. And so that, that's George Soros always seems extremely interesting because he fits into this category. Um, and uh, I wonder how it is that Jeffrey Epstein gets so much focus on his life and maybe George Soros doesn't get so much focus on his life because there's obviously been a lot. And every time you look at it, it's very scary. So is it just these guys are so important to an operation or set of operations? Is it that they know so many things about um, skeletons in the closet? Or is it that they're just invaluable as assets? What, who, why, why do these guys keep uh, remaining um, uh, unaccountable? Do you know? Unaccountable? Well, obviously, who's going to keep them accountable? Who's going to make them? Because they are part of the government, in a sense, even though they're not government employees. It sounds like a naive question, but there's got to be a way. I, I keep trying to think of uh, different ways that you can maybe start, like, how would we change society then to make these? Because these people are some of the most powerful and wealthy. I just don't, I don't quite understand how they're allowed to float around like they do and do what they do. And examining these billionaire philanthropists and their... their um, ability to organize uh trickle down organization i mean you say that the above um them is like usaid and uh, not necessarily above but i would say horizontal maybe like yeah yeah okay like a fu an, an, another funding arm uh of big development organizations that basically uh then seed other organizations into creation that then seed non-governmental organizations into creation or just off those non-governmental organizations are funded directly depending how much distance you want to create but really it's just a complicated um network of cia conduits that's what it seems yes. like well you could from what I, from my experience if you if you have a pro nato pro america or, or like an organization that does seem western that would probably promote some social values of the western world as well you can probably trace them back in two or three steps back to either a down for democracy or usa or, or open society foundation because it might be that may, maybe there's another intermediary organization in between that's a, a middle layer but two steps or maximum three steps before you will always go back to because you see who funds this who funds that and at the end you'll always see and down for democracy and those are tied to the state department so with many organizations you can do this experiment yourself go to any ngo that you think is pro-western check who funds them check their reports on annual fundings and look at the organizations check the organizations look at who funds them and guaranteed you'll find either the State Department or an organization that's very close to them in just two or three steps. So it, it's like, um, I mean, it's very much, it looks like a computer virus, doesn't it? How it, it takes a, a hold. Um, how, how are countries in that region meant to actually stop this happening? Well, it's very difficult. So that that's also very true. How, how would you even stop this? Many countries like in Central Asia have actually done that. So they would ban the Open Society Foundation from operating within their country. And the Open Society Foundation, what they do is in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and I believe it was Kyrgyzstan as well, they try to operate there as well. But some of these countries, they ban them. And so what they do is this is the worst country. <laughs> they say this is the least free country on the planet. They have banned the Open Society Foundation. This is unacceptable. They, they, well, they, they, they'll they probably make them rank like the lowest in the democracy index because they have connections <laughs> everywhere. <man. laughs> Whoever makes yeah. the democracy indexes or yeah. uh, you could say welfare indexes, they'll just say, yeah, part of the welfare index is having the Open Society Foundation operates, so they'll they'll make them very low. They'll say these countries are terrible countries. So uh, the only way to stop them would be to ban them. But the ramifications of that are also vast because that might mean your country doesn't get a lot of investment. So it's a complex issue. It's not entirely clear how you would stop this. So it's it's a positive if you want uh, if you're a resilient country who wants to have 
um, independence within the world, it's best to start from a state where you don't have to be reliant on such um, uh, nefarious characters. But really, it's a lot like um, a form of organizational usury. I suppose you've got a lack of inter infrastructure and funding. So you're borrowing that infrastructure and funding um, at a, 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 a cre an extremely high interest rate into uh, eventually so high that you'll capitulate your con uh, country and the, the, the banking country takes you over just zoop, and it's another way in. The funding is something, I mean, it's a fa fantastically uh, interesting subject. Let's get back on to um, the here and now, or the almost here and now, because we were talking about the um, campaign in Ukraine. Um, now, we were talking about the 2004 poor campaign, uh, and we're going to go on to the 2014 and the Maidan, the massacre at the Maidan. Um, and uh, we can then look at now. And obviously, this is really amazing, isn't it? Ten-year gaps in between. So starting 2004, 2014, and next year, 2024, I feel like we're coming up to a big event. It's almost like it's uh, it, it, it's on a, a proper cycle. <sighs> Tell people how your version of how we got from pre pora to now okay so ukraine was has historically in the past two decades has been a relatively neutral state it was not very pro russian even though there were tendencies to be pro russia but it was not pro western definitely and yanukovych who was the president of ukraine before 2014 he was a relatively neutral president, but he, he was liked by Moscow. So in 2014, there were debates about the relations between Ukraine and Russia and Ukraine and the EU. And there was an economic deal, which was the EU trade deal between Ukraine and EU. But there was also an alternative, which was the Eurasian trade deal between Ukraine and Russia. And Russia and Ukraine are very close trade partners as well. Uh, Russia is a very massive economy and they have close relations with Ukraine. And Yanukovych chose at the last minute the Eurasian economic deal. And this made a lot of people angry. And people started protesting. And this was called the Maidan. The Maidan uh, protests were organized in 2014 by a massive network of NGOs, the same way they organized the Orange Revolution. They organized the 2004 revolution, and the the man I the man I mentioned before, Ole Rybach. I don't know if I'm pronouncing the name correctly. He said that in 2014 we're planning on doing the same thing we did in 2004. It's going great, and we I think we will succeed. And they did succeed in 2014. If we were to summarize, what happened was Yanukovych was kicked out of power due to a massive protest. Many people were killed during the protest. Between the there were clashes between the Yanukovych police forces and the protesters, and at the end Yanukovych had to flee. He fled the country, and a new pro-Russia government was installed. And with Petro Poroshenko, he was sorry, uh, I said pro-Russia. I mean pro-EU government was installed. And with Petro Poroshenko and the people that came after, there was a change in the cabinets and the change in the parliament which included a lot of people, 20, 30 some people that were funded by, and they were employed almost uh, by uh, organizations like the Atlantic Council, like the National Endowment for Democracy, like the o Open Society Foundation. They were very closely tied to these people and they were able to enter the parliament. We could talk about these people later, but they were able to infiltrate the parliament and the positions of power, not just the parliament, but the positions of power, like the finance minister, the minister for infrastructure. These people were all connected to American okay. organizations like the USAID is and that, the ones I mentioned. Is it Natalie Ionesco, who is a yeah. finance uh, yeah. minister? Yeah. And so, 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 okay, right. Um, 
all of these people who you're alluding to here um, took their place in power after the Maidan, which of course we'll talk about later. And uh, who do they have links to? <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a lot of links like there, to... isn't there? There's, there's a, a lot, lot of links. links. <laughs> uh, so uh, there are a lot of people like Hannah Hopko we, we can talk about we can talk about Mustafa Naim who was the lead journalist during the Maidan that promoted the, all the protests against the Yanukovych government and he worked at Ukrainska Pravda and this this was a newspaper and this newspaper was sold to the Soros Fund management and 100% of its rights were sold to Soros Fund management. So it's an entirely Soros Fund newspaper organization. And this man named Mustafa Naim, he, he was also trained by the State Department in the United States in, in order to promote democracy. He was one, in one of these little known programs. And a lot of journalists, journalists like this, a lot of, most of them are called like activists or uh, yeah, and generally just activists, NGO activists that were doing other work before, uh, worked with and down for democracy. They were fa- funded by either the Open Society Foundation or and down for democracy. All all of their work, and these people were able to enter the levels of. They were able to control the levels of power. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Mustafa Naim was just just one example. We can talk about many examples. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so let's go back to the Maidan. Yeah, Microsoft. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's an extremely interesting link. Well, of course it is. Uh, There's a lot of uh, is always like a feeling that the World Economic Forum aligned folks are always just behind the scenes, and the powerful Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, of course, um, and Bill Gates himself and Microsoft always tinkering around outside the scenes uh ibm always involved in naughty stuff you know there's all of these same old same old names that come up over and over again that we get suspicious of so let's go back to the maidan though let's go back to the maidan because that's a really i mean i've seen lots of both sides uh, oh, had such a weird journey over the years but i've seen the propaganda that is like oh it's the best thing ever we revolution and look at this indignity that got put upon us it's by that side and then i see the others that say exactly the same thing from that side what happened at the maidan explain to people about the maidan because it's probably the most important event in ukrainian modern ukrainian history well the maidan was not a singular event but it was a it was something that lasted a few months and the culmination was in it led to the 2014 February February 20th. That was the particularly important date during the Maidan, you could say, the campaign. And even though it led a few months, the peak was exactly there because then that day, around 49 people were killed in the Maidan Square between the, during the clashes between the Berkut, that, that's the police force of the Yanukovych regime, and the protesters. And that event that led to the death of 49 people. That's what really made Yanukovych unpopular among the eyes of the Ukrainians. And that's what made, that's why the parliament wanted him to leave as well. So that event forced Yanukovych to flee, which led into the pro-NATO government. But the part, the particular aspects, the details of that event, what happened on February 20th, that's what's interesting. And that's what we included in the article that was not really mentioned in many places. I haven't really seen many people talk about this. Yeah, I like this. I like this. I like going to places where where people aren't, aren't talking about it and dipping my toe in. But you really, again, took the lead and became the expert on this. And uh, I, I've, went because I've been going through, um, editing and drafting and 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 checking everything um i've got to learn loads and see lots behind the curtain of what was going on it's such an organized obvious um operation uh, really uh sent it off they know exactly the russians know exactly what's going on even the ukrainian people really the majority of them know exactly what's going on but a load of them are like oh western money though <laughs> they're just happy to sell to the highest bidder but the danger they're put, putting themselves on well it's 
they're putting themselves in is 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 pretty severe um because instability in the region if it led to all out war i don't think ukraine the ukrainian the next ukrainian war would last that long um what do you see right okay okay in the maidan let's not not lose track let's go back because i have a habit of doing that i have lots of thoughts that come into my head I do apologize to anyone listening i do try and keep track the maidan where did it go wrong <laughs> <laughs> well it went wrong in many places yes. yeah 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 yeah. so the main place that it went wrong was it in february 20th that, that was when the massive clashes happened and that's when the protesters that were also that also had arms ak-47s that were present in the maidan square and the barracoot police were clashing with the protesters that really had the the AK-47s. So people don't really realize this because it was such a chaotic event. Even the videos, it's very hard to tell. Uh, but there was an investigative journalist, which I, I don't want to not mention, Ivan Kachanovsky. He, he did the lead work on this. And that's what my knowledge is based on. And it, it was very good. It was a very good investigation. And e even though many people kind of know that there were weird things going about, the, in order to, he's the one that did the detailed work. But if we were to summarize this, what happened was the protesters that were present during the Maidan, led by uh, Parasiuk, Volodymyr Parasiuk, he, he was the one that organized people to go up to tall buildings like the Hotel Ukraina. That's the famous one. And this was done secretly, it's not really out in the open. And he was able to shoot at protesters and blame it on the Belkut police. It was a false flag operation that was probably, even though this part is not entirely clear, it was probably promoted by the pro-EU parties in Ukraine and the anti-Yanukovych parties. And they would go up to these tall buildings and they had green helmets that was, that was also reported by a BBC journalist. And uh, they would shoot at the protesters and people saw that they were being shot at. There were a hundred eyewitnesses that saw that the shots that killed the protesters came from a very tall building. And in the footage, you can see as well. And they were wearing the same green helmets that the protesters were also wearing during the, the Maidan protest. And they, they killed 49 people. And the ballistic reports also show that the, the bullets that hit these people, for example, some of the people the, the bullet wounds were from here to here. So in order to have a bullet wound like this or even lower, you can't have this in a horizontal line. That, that's why people think the ballistic shows that the reports show that this was done by the protesters because in order to have an angle like this, an entry here and an exit here, you would have to shoot from a very high place. And there's also reports between, you can also see bullet bullet marks in the tall, in the tall in the polls near the Hotel Ukraina, which shows that the Berku police was also clashing with the protesters, the, the protest were, protesters with the AK-47s. So this was a, you, you can read the details in the report, but this was a false flag operation in order to discredit Yanukovych. And afterwards, even though some people came out, like anonymous people came out to the BBC admitting, yeah, I was shooting at the police, and I was shooting at their feet, even though they don't say I was shooting at the protesters, because the people that were shooting from the tall buildings are the same people that were shooting at the Berku police. So you have to logically it would mean that, yeah, the protesters shooting at the Berku police also did a false flag operation. Uh, yeah, and they, they made Yanukovych flee. And even though all the evidence is out in the open, not many people talk about this. And the Berka police were, two Berka policemen were charged with the murder, even though they never admitted, uh, they, they never accepted the fact that they, they did the murder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, they always need their patsies, don't they? Um, just to, to uh, that's an amazing amount of people that died. That's an amazing amount of people, really. And and I remember watching the um, images 
and it was really unclear what was going on because you know bullet sounds and people falling down and that's all you see and you're not sure what's going on it's all chaotic and you can tell there's a lot around it but that really did seem why did it get to that stage do you think do you think it's just like within an operation like this you've got all of this many layers of uh disassociation through ngos and conduits after conduit after conduit up to the development organizations that they feel pretty confident in enacting the um atmosphere for this type of thing and the environment for this type of thing to break out um yet they like to distance themselves but some of the working parts down below take take it on the, do you think they take it on their own initiative or is it a much more do you think it was a much more organized attempt to spark a violent revolution from what was essentially um a, a slowly um uh, faltering um, forced revolution non-violent well, well revolution. I, I would say you know, the, I, I can't say this conclusively because I haven't seen the evidence but the United States definitely was a part of this because we, we see that just before Victoria Newland was out there sending out and giving out sandwiches to the protesters there and it's uh, to me it's highly unlikely <laughs> that they didn't imagine. know what was going on i don't believe victoria newland's sandwiches taste nice at all <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> i think it's rotten cucumber in there or something i don't know what rotten cucumber looks like anyway but, but can you explain but, a little oh go on sorry well i, I was just going to say you can also hear the uh, leaked phone conversations between victoria newland and uh, higher ups in Ukraine. And they, so they, let's they talk about well. Victoria Newland, is what I was going to say. It's probably the best time. Um, can you describe who Victoria Newland is? Because I knew of her from little comments here and there, and then I learned a little bit more about her. But I suppose you probably know a little bit more about her. Well, she she was responsible with the State Department for uh, European and Eurasian affairs. So she was specializing in this region of the world for the United States. That's why she was present there. And she was, uh, she was obviously a pro-NATO person. And she was also in the <laughs> National Endowment for Democracy. Yeah. yeah and yeah. she was also part of uh, National Endowment for Democracy. And she uh, she wanted to establish a very controlled government in Ukraine and the leaked phone conversations, you can hear this and that they, they were talk about uh, I forget the name of the person, but that, yeah, we should install this person instead. The, uh, Klitschko I believe it was the boxer, the famous Ukrainian boxer. <laughs> oh, yeah. They were considering him as a part of the... Well, it's easy. I mean, he's easy to manipulate. He's got like, he got angels and devils all over his shoulders <laughs> and his brain. He's got stars and circles going around his head. I know sure, how he goes. Exactly. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Well, New Newlands, I think she's the one who... Uh, I I know she's the one who made the um uh second September the eleventh comments um that were were seemed like they were trying to spark more like you know they want to spark another big event that is going to happen that's going to be like another September eleventh that will get the oh that will get the fires burning in people hey we kill some Americans on American soil we'll always get the guys to get our back and now and she's very much that type of person she's um. I, I mean, I would say inhumane, but other people could use different words that that, that suit her and probably would find a better one. Um, what what was her role in all this? Just promotion or just showing support? Well, it was not definitely not just showing support because she was talking with the higher ups to make sure that the new formed government, because she was expecting that there was going to be a coup and there was going to be a new government. And she wanted to make sure that the people that entered the new government government were with uh, U.S. interests and they were part of someone they brought up themselves or someone that uh, works with U.S. organizations. So that's what she wanted to make sure, I believe. I don't know if she was directly involved in creating the coup, but she wanted to take advantage of whatever the result was going to be. And 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 here we go. Now we can get to the point. What was the result? Who who were the people that got in? I mean, what type of people got into power after that? Well, the result was definitely that the people that got in were people 
very closely related to the American government. It was, it's not just like these people are generally pro-NATO, pro-EU. These people are directly from organizations like the Atlantic Council, which is the... They, all they do is promote NATO. That's their job, to expand NATO and be against the Russian regime. So these people were in these organizations. <laughs> I, I, I got to say this. I just come to my mind. I think you... <laughs> and the juxtaposition makes sense. I think you'd want to call them non-governmental politicians. Yeah, surely. <laughs> so, which of course is it is uh, hilarious. Anyway, go on, continue. <laughs> well, well, yeah, that's just it. And these people have, from my investigation, these people have nothing to do with Ukraine, and they they are very well connected with. Uh, these NGOs that promote anti-corruption, that's a, that's a famous line, for example, the Anti-Corruption Action Center. These people create organizations like this that get funded by someone like the National Endowment for Democracy or Open Society Foundation, or like, uh, this is not an exact quote, but free, free elections organization. These, there are very particular names that they like to choose that have the words democracy, free, elections, anti-corruption, these are some key words that you can really see and you can say, you can point and say, yeah, this organization is definitely a forum funded because for some reason they've chosen this kind of branding where they, they, they put all the good good uh, adjectives together to create an organization that should not look suspicious to people. And the new government, uh, we've talked about a few people like the micro, uh, CEO of Microsoft, from of Ukraine, he was also part of this new government, and he was also closely related to Soros because Soros was the one that funded the search for the new members of the uh, new Yatsenyuk government. They needed like twenty or thirty people to join the government to do some bureaucratic stuff, and you, you need a search company to do that. And Soros will personally said, "Yes, I will promote. Uh, I will pay." so that this company can search for new members for the new Ukrainian government. That is amazing stuff, how many people were involved in some nefarious uh, dealings or who were involved in nefarious dealings got into positions of power afterwards. So let, let's go for it. I'm going to name a guy. I'm, I'm just having a, a little look here at the, the article itself. So we mentioned earlier Hannah Hopko. Um, who worked as a communications manager for Ukraine Citizen Action Network, which is a USAID contractor in Kiev. Um, uh, also, and this is something that I find very interesting and I want to make note of, in Kiev, while also uh, leading various environmental journalism training programs in Donetsk. Now, I, I mean, I, I know lots of people are sick to death of environmentalism and the backwards and forwards, but that is the number one cover, isn't it, that they used with the NGOs very early on, especially in the um, Czechoslovakia, the velvet revolution they came in really with just environmental campaigners as well very early on is this something that you see all throughout it this environmental virtue surely there, there's a few topics like this like the environment like if you if you talk if this organization talks about climate change a lot that's uh, a primary candidate for western influence and they talk about women's rights or something that's a social issue that's really specific to the, to the West and doesn't really exist in other countries. That's yeah, a, yeah. like environmentalism is the prime example. That's one of the flags that you have to, the red flags that you have to pay attention to, to identify these organizations as, you know, this organization is not very unbiased. Uh, yeah, Hopco. So she's connected with... Um... Uh, things to do with the US with USAID, which obviously has massive connections um, to the State Department. She's also got other connections and some of the other ones that we mentioned in there. Um, well, and these are people who you looked into properly. Uh, Svetlana Zalishchuk, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. Um, became a member of the Steering Committee for World Movement for Democracy. What type of Orwellian speak is that, uh, which had been founded by NED, the National Endowment for Democracy, 
Um, the organization designed and implemented more than 30 projects nationwide involving hundreds of civil society organizations supported by international donors such as USAID and CEDA and Open Society and all of the usual gang all together. So these guys are like really, really deeply in there. Um, Olo Rybachuk, I think you've mentioned Olo yes. Rybachuk already. A uh, really interesting actor. So um, Rybachuk has links to um, uh, a media as well, but by, uh, by uh, and the media network and Pierre Media, mm-hmm. of course, another one of those actors behind the scenes that has an air of George Soros about him, you know, like a future George Soros. Exactly. I say that because George Soros is so wrinkly nowadays. Um, and he has lots of connections in the same way. Um, who were the one, who was the one who you think is like the most interesting for a, a more comprehensive investigation of just one character? Who do you think is the person out of like the people that you studied who's the most interesting out of those? Well, out of the ones that went into the new Ukrainian government or the ones that were involved in the 2014 Maidan, I would say definitely the man I mentioned, Ole. Right about you. He is definitely the the most higher up one because he was there before everyone else. He was the right hand man of Yushchenko, and he, he is involved in the two thousand and four revolution. Right. He is involved in two thousand and fourteen. He's involved all the time. So, I and he's a he's fellow the, of the National Endowment for Tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. Well. That's amazing. I, I mean, his links are, are quite fantastic. Um, I think he's going to be a guy who we're going to uh, focus in on a little bit more. So once these guys took power, what, what's what been, I mean, how do we get to where we are now? From well, the Maidan and what happened there and the post-Maidan forming of these um power players in ukrainian politics these new power players who were obviously so aligned with western ideals um what happened afterwards well what happened exactly afterwards was the donbass war that was the precursor to the war we have right now and uh, in the in donbass donetsk and luhansk they wanted to declare independence from the ukrainian government and for the people that don't know, if you were to divide Ukraine into two parts, eastern and western, from the Dnieper River, the eastern part is very pro-Russia and the western part is, as expected, very pro-EU and NATO. So Donbass, if you don't know, is on the eastern side and Donetsk and Luhansk as well. And they declared independence and the Ukrainian government went into clashes with these independent republics. So Russia also pr- provide support for these uh, republics that want to become independent. And this started a uh, Ukraine civil war and the Ukrainian government were, would fight with these Donbass forces. And this was the 2014 war. That's what create, created the annexation of Crimea by Russia. And that's what led us to, the, that's what increased tensions that led us to this point because afterwards things didn't get better. Petro Poroshenko and uh, Zelensky, all these people were very closely tied to to NATO and US interests. So the culmination of these events, including provocations by the US government, like the intercontinental, sorry, not intercontinental, but the intermediary range uh, ballistic missile treaty, and we, the United States, pulled out of that one. That also created tensions, the ABM treaty, which they pulled out before, but they were trying to create an ABM shield, the anti-ballistic missile shield in Poland and Romania. And they said it was against Iran and North Korea, but they were just as well against Russia as well. And they had offensive capabilities as well. It's very close to Moscow. So all these provocations, including like NATO saying we like the aspirations of Ukraine, even in 2019 and 2021, and the culmination led to the point where in the Munich Security Conference, Zelensky said, well, we might want to, re-, he didn't say this explicitly, but implicitly he said that the, we might want to renuclearize again. And afterwards, uh, everyone knows what happened. Russia declared war and we're at where we are right now. Yeah, of course. I mean, you can't even I mean, it's just kind of like um, 
there's no way that Ukraine could completely renuclearize without the help of Western powers. So the, this, the idea of that is just kind of, um, it's not really uh, something that's happening or going to happen. It's just an ex- excuse to say we're going to escalate because even yeah. if they did renuclearize, well, it takes years and years, decades to get to the point where you could uh, create something and then you can have it destroyed in a matter of no time by precision bombing or something else. And it's not like Russia are going to allow it. Um, And it'll just escalate tensions, but tensions are already there. So the threat of it doesn't even make any sense uh, because it's really, if they've got the support of the West, well, the West is already nuclearized and well, we can just get new... It's the same sort of dynamics you've seen all around the world play out in slightly different ways, uh, depending on the culture and it, the the country's closeness to Western intelligence apparatus. And I think in this regards to um, uh, Zufika Ali Bhutto in Pakistan during the early 70s, trying to get a race for Pakistan to... Um, have uh, nuclear weapons technology ahead of India uh, and they failed in that but they still kept pushing and at the same time Kissinger was saying out loud that they'll punish Pakistan for that but in behind closed doors he's trying to help them get nuclear arms and they were playing this weird game uh, and this weird game is just it's constant all around the world happening it's this nuclear standoff that the echoes of the past it doesn't really mean anything because the chances are that a nuclear war is going to happen to a scale that that is is um, epic is very unlikely. The chances that a nuclear weapon is going to be used to scare the bejesus out of people is get becoming increasingly more likely. The chance that the late fifties uh, indulgent. Uh, ideas of the U.S. State Department and people like John Foster Dulles about the idea of using small nuclear weapons against each other and leaving it at that, uh, that is getting closer. So big ones I don't think are, are, are as likely. But we are definitely on the precipice now. I, I mean, I, I said at the beginning of this that you were young, <laughs> but I think people will have worked out that 21. you, yeah, yeah, I know. Twenty-one. I, it makes me sick. Calm. <laughs> Twenty-one sick. just now. <laughs> ah, so happy go. birthday! Oh, happy birthday! You. No, again, it, it, I both feel happy for you, and I feel in pain by the fact that oh man, I wish when I was at twenty-one, I could have uh, been doing what you're you're on the track of doing. Um, where, so, so I'm asking you, and I say you're young, but you've obviously got an ability to use your logic and discern uh, events in your own uh, particular way. What do you see happening in the near future yourself? Well, what I see happening is with the policy that the U.S. has followed with provoking Russia, this has pushed, this is what many international analysts have also said, but this has pushed Russia into the arms of the Chinese. So in the in recent, uh, soon we'll see much more close cooperation with Russia and China, I believe, because very recently this month, uh, China and Russia were conducting uh, drills uh, in waters near Japan, and they're conducting uh, together military drills so that, well, well, why would you conduct a military drill with another country? It's because you want to have a military alliance against two, against the primary opponent of Russia, which is the United States. So even though in Central Asia, you could say that Russia and China would be natural adversaries, you could say that, but the the hostile policies of the US has forced Russia and to be go to China and say, let's form an alliance against the US because China will be the competitor of the US in this century. In the uh, 2050, 2060, it's not going to be Russia versus the U.S. It's going to be China versus the U.S. and the Chinese military versus the U.S. So even you could say from the perspective of the United States, this is a bad move because even though before they were a dominant power, they were the sole superpower in the world, they, they were stronger than everyone combined. They were stronger than China and Japan and Russia and all the countries combined. 
now with the development of China, that's no longer going to be the case in, let's say, 40, 50 years. They're going to be almost equal powers. If not, China might even be stronger than the US. So Ru America would want Russia on its side to fight against China, but these policies will make that impossible. Yeah. Wow. 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 I agree. Um, I think that they, the, the Western powers have much they push. They know it's going to be hard for China and Russia to adopt Western um, functions and Western control over their capital and other things uh, and their markets on a whole. And they're not going to relinquish that control very easily. And that's what it comes down to. Globalism all, only works if all parts are playing together. So the next stage is obviously subjugation. So I agree. I, 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 I agree with exactly what you say. Um, that's been an epic journey through this. I mean, I'm still learning loads. It's a fresh area for me. Um, I'm sure you're going to have people reaching out to you. Where do people find you? Where do people contact you? Well, they can find me on Twitter, Khan underscore underscore Disley, or they can find me on Substack, Khan Disley, uh, Substack.com. Uh, at the moment, those are the only places I'm in, but... Yeah, I might have a YouTube channel very soon where I upload videos, so you can find me there. But mostly Twitter, you can contact me anytime. Awesome. Well, if I can be a help on your YouTube channel, I'd be happy to do that as well. And I know we're going to work on some other things in the near future. Thank you. Truly. Thank you for coming Thank on you. the Newspace podcast and speaking about all this. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for having me.